there's nothing quite as comforting as the familiar rhythm of life. A typical day starts with the rooster's crow from the Johnson's yard, followed by the usual flurry of activity in the small neighborhood where I've spent all my years. The dreams, though, they've started to fracture that rhythm. I find myself in these hauntingly vivid nightmares, a strange man, gaunt and menacing, always hunting me. The dreams always start the same way. I find myself standing at the edge of a dense, dark forest. The trees rise up to blot out the moon and the stars, leaving me bathed in darkness. I can smell the damp earth and the rustling leaves. It's as if the forest is alive, a silent observer, waiting for the chase to begin. Then, he appears. The man stands at the other end of the clearing, dressed in an antiquated suit, a disturbingly out-of-place sight amidst the primal surroundings. His eyes gleam in the darkness, a predatory smile on his lips. He looks like a gentleman, but the chill in his gaze tells a different story. He's not here for pleasantries. He's here to hunt. The chase begins almost as if on cue. I run, my heart pounding in my ears. The forest around me blurs as I dodge low branches and leap over gnarled roots, every breath a struggle as fear overwhelms me. Behind me, I can hear him. He doesn't hurry and doesn't seem to need to. He walks at an unhurried pace, as if certain of his victory. I can hear his laughter then, a bone-chilling sound that echoes through the forest, always close and always hunting. It's not just the pursuit that scares me. It's the promise of what might happen if he catches me. Often in these dreams, I stumble upon odd landmarks, a decrepit cabin, a well overgrown with ivy, a pond as dark as ink. They're familiar, in a haunting way, as if I've seen them in another life. I try to hide, to escape, but the man always finds me. The dreams are visceral, the terror I feel in them carrying into my waking hours. The fear of being hunted, of not knowing why or how to escape, is a constant presence in my life now. I've stopped looking forward to sleep, to the supposed rest it should bring. I dread the sun going down, the night bringing with it the inevitable visit to the forest, to that man, and to the terrifying chase. Every morning, I wake up in cold sweat, gasping for air, the memory of his gleaming eyes, his cold laughter, and his monstrous grin are all fresh in my mind. It's more than just a nightmare. I'm determined not to let these dreams steal my peace. I have a simple job at the local bookstore, a comfortable home, and good friends around me. I'm not letting some man from my nightmares ruin it all. So I'm trying to brush off the dreams, hoping they'll fade. The morning sun is casting long shadows as I sit on my porch, cradling a cup of steaming coffee. The neighborhood is quiet, save for the distant chirping of birds and the soft rustle of wind through the trees. My eyes are fixed on the house next door, an old Victorian with peeling paint and a slightly overgrown garden. It's been empty for months. Today, though, the quiet is disrupted by a large moving truck lumbering into the driveway. The hum of the engine breaks the tranquil silence, followed by the creak of the truck's brakes as it comes to a stop. I watch with curiosity as the back of the truck rolls up with a deafening clatter, revealing a collection of boxes and furniture. Then, he steps out. My heart jumps in my chest as I recognize the man emerging from the driver's side of the moving truck. It's him, the man from my nightmares. Dressed in a simple t-shirt and jeans, he's undeniably ordinary, yet my mind screams at me that he's anything but. He stretches, a satisfied grin spreading across his face as he surveys his new domain. The man from my nightmares is here in broad daylight, the same cold eyes, the same menacing grin. Every detail about him is alarmingly accurate to the tormentor who chases me each night through darkened forests in my sleep. He even has the same peculiar pace, the unhurried movement of a predator confident in his hunt. I grip the arms of my chair, my coffee cup forgotten as I watch him move around, directing the movers, occasionally glancing at my house. Every look sends a shiver down my spine, and I feel an odd sensation of being hunted, 
even from the safety of my porch. The movers busy themselves carrying furniture and boxes inside the house, but my eyes are glued to the man, the hunter of my dreams. He finally turns and heads back to the moving truck. I release the breath I've been holding and sink back into my chair. Despite the morning sun warming my skin, a chilling sense of foreboding washes over me. The boundary between my nightmares and reality has been shattered. As the movers continue their work, I find myself imprisoned in my own fear, the man from my nightmares now living just next door. He strides towards me with a chillingly familiar grin, his hand outstretched in greeting. Hello, neighbor. I'm Mr. Crowley, he announces, his voice honeyed with an easy charm. It's unsettling to hear that voice outside of my dreams. I swallow, and my mouth suddenly becomes dry. Uh, hi. I'm Danny, I force out, reaching to shake his hand. His grip is cold and firm. The icy touch sends a jolt up my arm, and I withdraw as quickly as I can. Crowley doesn't seem to notice, or if he does, he doesn't show it. You have a lovely home, Danny, he comments, his gaze shifting past me to take in my house. I feel the urge to shield my home from his invasive stare, but all I manage is a muttered thanks. Thank you. And welcome to the neighborhood, I respond, trying to inject some warmth into my voice. The tremor that threatens to shake loose, I push back, hoping he doesn't notice. He only nods in response, his attention still focused on my home. Yes, I think I'll like it here. The words hang heavy in the air, laced with a disturbing finality that I can't quite decipher. They're simple words, commonplace in such a situation, but coming from him, they seem to bear an ominous weight. There's a silence that stretches between us. I watch him for a moment longer, searching for some hint of the man I know from my nightmares. But Crowley just stands there, returning my gaze, his eyes unblinking. Finally, with a nod and a curt, Good day, Danny. He turns on his heel and strides away, leaving me standing on my porch. As he walks away, his laughter floats back to me, an eerie echo of my nightmares. I watch him until he disappears into his new home. My heart sinks. This sense of foreboding is impossible to ignore now. That night, I lie in my bed, staring at the ceiling blankly, the ghost of Crowley's laughter playing in my mind. It's a cruel, mocking sound that seems to vibrate in the silence of my bedroom, bouncing off the walls, filling the space with an unsettling dread. The world outside is quiet, serene even. The familiar sounds of my suburban neighborhood have settled down for the night. The soft hum of crickets and the distant hoot of an owl are the only indicators of life. Yet, the tranquility feels deceptive a thin veil shrouding the lurking danger next door. My eyes keep drifting towards my bedroom window, half expecting to see Crowley's silhouette against the dimly lit street. Every shadow seems to morph into his menacing figure, each rustle of leaves outside is a whisper of his approach. My skin prickles with anxiety, my heart pounding in my chest as if keeping time with the ticking of the clock. When sleep finally does claim me, it's anything but peaceful. The dreams are more vivid than ever, my subconscious mind refusing to offer any break from the reality of the day. I find myself back in the dark forest, Crowley in relentless pursuit. His laughter, once confined to my dreams, now feels incredibly tangible, a horrific soundtrack to the twisted hunt. Every mocking chuckle sets my nerves on edge, heightening my fear and making me run faster, but never fast enough. I wake up with a start, gasping, as the first rays of daylight stream through my window. I sit up, my heart hammering against my ribcage, the residual fear from the dream clenching it in an iron grip. I wipe away cold sweat from my forehead, trying to regulate my ragged breathing. The corners of my room, once filled with comforting familiarity, now seem to harbor shadows that carry an undertone of menace. As I sit there, my bedroom bathed in the soft morning light, it strikes me how much my life has changed in just one day. 
This isn't just about nightmares anymore, not just the silent battle with my subconscious. Crowley, the tormentor of my dreams, is now a physical entity, living just next door. My life is a mounting fever dream. Every day bleeds into the next, a terrifying blend of nightmarish reality and dreams so vivid they leave their fingerprints on my waking hours. Each day seems to fray the edges of reality a little more. It's the small things, the tiny, almost insignificant details that make the ordinary feel bizarre and makes me question my sanity. There's a strange familiarity to Crowley's actions, an unsettling parallel between his movements and those of the hunter from my nightmares. He echoes my dream self's gestures, the way he brushes his fingers against the bark of the neighborhood oak, the tilt of his head as he watches a bird take flight, even the rhythm of his stride. It's as if he's shadowing the version of me that exists in the nightmares, an eerie mirror that sends chills racing down my spine. His knowledge, too, is unsettling. There are things he knows, intimate things, details that are rooted in the dreamscape, buried deep in the recesses of my subconscious. Like during our neighborhood barbecue, Amid the buzz of conversation and laughter, he narrated a tale, his voice smooth, nonchalant. It was a story about a dark forest, a hidden cave nestled between boulders, and a chase. The similarities struck me like a bolt of lightning, my hamburger halfway to my mouth, frozen in place. I watched him, my heart hammering in my chest as his eyes met mine. They were gleaming, a spark of unspoken knowledge in their depths a secret shared between us. There's also an invasive proximity to him. He's always there, a touch too close for comfort. At the supermarket, in the park, he's there. It's as if he's weaved himself into the fabric of my everyday life, a chilling constant I can't shake off. Then, the gifts start arriving. The first gift appears on a cool Tuesday morning. It's a single black feather, sleek and shiny, left on my doorstep. I remember the blackbirds from my dreams. The feather seems to hum with the same eerie energy, a piece of my nightmares spilling over into my reality. Days later, a small pouch filled with pebbles appears. They're smooth, water-worn, the kind you'd find by a stream. My heart lurches as I pour them into my hand, each one a chilling reminder of the rocky riverbed I'd often crossed in my dreams, with Crowley's laughter echoing around me. The antique key comes next, an intricate piece of metal, the design worn by time. It's identical to the key in my dream, the one that unlocks the rusted gate leading deeper into the forest. Holding it sends a shudder of dread through me. Each gift feels like a cruel taunt, a demonstration of how effortlessly Crowley is merging my nightmares with my waking life. The normalcy of my suburban neighborhood is being contaminated by the elements of my dreams, transforming the familiar into something deeply unsettling. As the days pass, more gifts arrive, each one relating to my nightmares. There's a scrap of torn fabric that matches the shirt I wear in my dreams, a small vial of earth that smells just like the forest soil, and a crude drawing of the cave. The line between my dreams and reality blurs further with each item. They're innocuous on their own, yes, but together they form a terrifying narrative, a replication of the nightmares that have been tormenting me. The threatening letters follow soon after. I find the first threatening letter slipped under my front door. It's a simple envelope, innocuous, no different from any other piece of mail, but the chill that hits me as I pick it up is immediate, foreboding. I open it with shaky hands, unfolding the single piece of paper within. The message is short, the handwriting eerily familiar, a cruel reminder of the words I've seen etched into tree barks in my dreams. You can't run forever, Danny, it reads. The reality of the threat jolts through me, leaving me breathless. The following letters arrive in quick succession. They're slipped under my door or left in my mailbox. I'll always find you, one says. There's no escape, warns another. I'm closer than you think, another threatens. The words are a grim mirror of the taunts that haunt my dreams. 
Crowley's chilling laughter ringing in my ears. The most chilling letter arrives on a Sunday morning. Look behind you, it reads. I whirl around, half expecting to see Crowley standing there, but I'm greeted with the empty quiet of my living room. The fear, however, lingers, wrapping around me like a shroud. The fear, the uncertainty, it's crippling. I feel like I'm on a never-ending carousel of terror, the world spinning around me while I remain rooted to the spot, trapped in this nightmarish reality. The face in the mirror starts to become a stranger's, and the bags under my eyes show the sleepless nights and relentless fear. Desperate, I reach out to the local authorities. I find myself sitting inside the police station, my hands clutching the threatening letters and the eerie gifts. The fluorescence from the overhead lights bounces off the white walls, casting a harsh glow on everything. The usual background noise, the ringing phones, hushed conversations, and occasional laughter seem distant and muted. I take a deep breath, feeling the cold steel of the chair against my back as I sit across from Officer Murray. The police station is sterile and uninviting, a stark contrast to the horror story that I've come to share. Officer Murray, I begin, my voice trembling. Something is wrong, really wrong. I place the threatening letters and peculiar gifts on the table, my heart pounding in my chest. He takes his time examining the items, a frown creasing on his forehead. He picks up a letter, scanning it briefly before placing it back on the table. Danny, these are... unsettling, he admits, his eyes flickering with a brief moment of concern before they harden again. But, he adds, folding his arms over his chest, are you sure you're not overreacting? I mean, Crowley's been nothing but a model citizen since he moved here. Maybe you're just... misinterpreting things. I can't help but stare at him in disbelief. Overreacting? I echo, incredulous. Officer, these aren't just random letters and gifts. They're... they're elements from my dreams. My nightmares. And they're connected to Crowley. Officer Murray sighs deeply, running a hand through his thinning hair. Look, Danny. Mr. Crowley has become a respected individual in this community, he replies, his tone frustratingly calm. I think maybe you're just... He pauses, seemingly searching for the right words. I think you're just letting your imagination run away with you. No, I'm not, I argue, my hands clenched tightly in my lap. Something is wrong with Crowley. I can feel it. Murray doesn't immediately respond. He just looks at me a mixture of pity and concern on his face. Danny, he finally says, it sounds like you're dealing with a lot of stress. Have you thought about seeing a professional about these dreams? I stare at him, stunned. This was my last resort, my final hope for some form of help, and it's clear that it's falling on deaf ears. They don't believe me. I'm alone in this. With the disbelief of the police weighing heavy on my mind, I turn to professional help, seeking the opinion of a psychologist. The psychologist's office is a warm contrast to the sterile environment of the police station, filled with soft hues, comfortable seating, and a calming atmosphere. But even the soothing ambiance does little to ease my mounting anxiety as I sit across from Dr. Evelyn Reed, a seasoned psychologist known for her expertise in dream analysis. Mr. Thompson, Dr. Reed begins, her voice soft and reassuring. How can I assist you today? I take a deep breath, bracing myself. I've been having these nightmares, I start. They're recurring and... and they're getting worse. Dr. Reed gives a nod of understanding. Recurring nightmares can indeed be distressing. Can you tell me more about them? My hands clutch at the armrests as I tell her all about the dark forest, the relentless chase, the man who calls himself Crowley, and how he's no longer just a figure in my dreams. The words tumble out, ending with the strange gifts and threatening letters. Her eyebrows arch slightly as she scribbles notes. And you believe Mr. Crowley from next door is the man from your nightmares? Yes, I affirm, my voice barely more than a whisper. I know it sounds crazy, but I can't shake the feeling that he's... he's tormenting me. 
not just in my dreams, but in reality too. She observes me for a moment, her pen pausing against her notepad. Mr. Thompson, she begins carefully, nightmares are often our subconscious way of dealing with stress, anxiety, or fear. It's possible that you're projecting some of your anxieties onto Mr. Crowley. But the gifts, the letters, I argue, feeling a familiar frustration surge, can certainly be distressing, she agrees. But Danny, have you considered the possibility that they might be coincidences? Or perhaps someone is playing a cruel prank? I shake my head, my heart pounding. No, it's him. I know it is. Dr. Reed gives me a sympathetic smile. Danny, I can see you're distressed, and we're going to work through this. For now, I'd like to explore some strategies to manage your nightmares and the anxiety surrounding them. And in the meantime, maintain a safe distance from Mr. Crowley if it helps ease your mind. Her words offer little comfort. Yes, I'll nod and agree, and we'll discuss strategies and plans, but deep down, I know this is more than stress or fear. As the session ends, I step out onto the busy street, the reality of my situation hitting harder than ever. I'm living a waking nightmare, and no one else can see it. Crowley is out there, both in my dreams and my reality, and I'm the only one who knows the truth. A few days later, I'm pacing in my living room when I hear the piercing yelp. It's brief and cuts off suddenly, then replaced by a chilling silence. My heart clenches as I dash out, the scene on my lawn knocking the breath out of me. Benny, the neighbor's golden retriever, always a friendly and boisterous presence, lies motionless. The sight of his lifeless body sends a wave of nausea through me. A bitter taste of fear rises in my throat, the reality of the situation hitting harder than ever. I can no longer deny it, can no longer rationalize or downplay the terror that's slowly overtaken my life. With a newfound determination, I march to Crowley's house. He opens the door, that familiar, chilling smile on his face. Danny, he greets, his voice smooth. What brings you here? You, I say, my voice trembling with a mixture of fear and anger. It's you, isn't it? The gifts, the letters, Benny. His smile doesn't falter. Such accusations, Danny. And what makes you so sure? Because I see you, I admit, my heart pounding. I see you in my dreams, hunting me. And now, you're killing innocent animals. His laughter rings out, a chilling sound that echoes the terror of my nightmares. Oh, Danny, it's not just about hunting. It's not just about this life. We're connected, he murmurs, his words holding a cryptic undertone. What are you talking about, I demand a cold shiver running down my spine. Crowley merely smirks, his eyes glinting ominously. Figure it out, Danny, he says before closing the door in my face. His words, both a challenge and a threat, hang heavy in the air. Reeling, I retreat to my home, Crowley's cryptic hint ringing in my ears. Connected. Not just this life. What could he mean? That night, I sit hunched over my laptop, the soft glow of the screen the only source of light in my darkened living room. My mind buzzes with Crowley's words, connected, not just this life, a cryptic hint that has sent me down a rabbit hole on the internet. My fingers fly over the keyboard, opening tab after tab as I devour information. I begin with dream interpretation sites, scanning through explanations about being hunted or chased in dreams. Fear, fear, Evasion, running away from something in my waking life, none of these interpretations seem to fit. This is beyond the symbolism of dreams. This feels dangerously real. I change my search terms, venturing into less explored territories. I start reading about parallel realities, quantum theories, and alternative dimensions. The concepts are overwhelming, yet oddly fascinating. The idea that there could be multiple versions of us living different lives across infinite realities. It's daunting. But how does this connect to my dreams? And to Crowley? Changing tactics, I start reading about reincarnation, about past lives bleeding into the present. 
the idea of life after life, an eternal cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. It's fascinating, yet it brings me no closer to understanding my predicament. On a whim, I type in dream entities. The results make my heart skip a beat. The cursor hovers over the link titled, Dreamwalkers, Entities of the Dream World. I click, my heart pounding as the page loads. The screen fills with an eerie image, a spectral figure stepping through a dreamlike landscape. Below the image, the text reads, Dreamwalkers, known across different cultures and folklore, are thought to be powerful entities that can traverse and manipulate the realm of dreams. They exist at the boundary of our physical reality and the ethereal world of dreams, possessing the ability to move freely between the two. I scroll further, finding more information about these dreamwalkers. There are references to Native American beliefs, where dreamwalkers were considered spiritual guides that could bring messages from the spirit world, and sometimes they could influence dreams to teach lessons or offer guidance. But there's another, more sinister side to these beings. Some cultures feared them as malevolent entities, invaders of the dream realm who reveled in inducing terror, feeding off the fear and chaos they created. These dreamwalkers could manipulate dreams to the extent that the dreamer began to lose their sense of reality, becoming entangled in a web of nightmares. Most chilling of all are the accounts of dreamwalkers manifesting in the physical realm, blurring the line between dreams and reality. These stories speak of ominous signs, strange happenings, gifts linked to dreams, and the dreamer feeling a sense of dread in their waking life. My blood runs cold as I read these accounts. The gifts, the dread, Crowley's presence in both my dreams and reality. Everything falls into a terrifying pattern. The pieces of this puzzle finally seem to fit. I lean back in my chair, feeling as though the air has been sucked out of the room. Crowley isn't just a man from my dreams, nor is he a simple neighbor. He's a dreamwalker, an entity from the realm of nightmares that seeped into my reality. The stories vary. Ancient cultures revered them as gods, spirit guides, while others feared them as demons, malevolent beings who fed on the terror they incited in dreams. The more I read, the more parallels I draw between these dreamwalkers and Crowley. The control over dreams, the ability to inflict fear, the crossover into the physical realm. Could Crowley be one of these entities? It's late into the night when I finally close my laptop, my mind a whirlwind of theories and possibilities. This is beyond anything I've ever experienced, beyond anything I thought possible. But if I'm to believe my research, if I'm to believe in dreamwalkers, then I need to find a way to protect myself, to survive this relentless pursuit, before it's too late. I spend the next few days immersed in an exhaustive pursuit of knowledge. My research shifts from identifying the problem, Crowley, the dreamwalker, to finding a solution. A concept keeps appearing in various articles and forums. Lucid dreaming, a state of dream where one is aware they're dreaming and can exert control over the dream environment and narrative. It's a long shot, but at this point, I'm willing to try anything. I study techniques to induce lucid dreaming, everything from maintaining a dream journal to reality checks. I practice during the day, questioning my reality and writing down every detail I can recall from my dreams, however trivial they might seem. The night becomes a training ground. I fall asleep with the clear intention of becoming aware in my dreams, of controlling my actions rather than being a mere puppet in Crowley's twisted games. It's not easy, with most nights passing in the usual sense of fear and confusion. But one night, something shifts. I find myself standing in the familiar forest again, the cool wind carrying the sound of Crowley's laughter. I take a deep breath, grounding myself, focusing on the reality of my dream state. The realization sweeps over me with a potent clarity. I'm dreaming. I'm aware and I'm in control. Danny, always running, Crowley's voice echoes through the forest. Not this time, I respond, turning to face him. He steps out from the shadows, a cruel smirk adorning his face. 
but this time, I'm not afraid. I focus on my surroundings, willing the dark, oppressive forest to change. Slowly, the gnarled trees straighten, their dark bark giving way to a warm brown. The sky lightens, a gentle blue replacing the ominous gray. Warm sunlight comes through the branches, casting dancing shadows on the now lush, green grass under my feet. Crowley's smirk fades as he looks around. What is this? he demands, his cool demeanor faltering for the first time. This is my dream, I say, stepping towards him. And in my dream, I'm not the prey. Crowley's laughter rings out, a sharp, jarring sound, but it lacks its usual chill. Well, let's see what you can do, Danny. I move closer to him, my footsteps muffled by the soft carpet of grass. I keep my focus on Crowley, on his reactions, but my mind is on the environment around us. Watch, I reply, a steady determination in my voice. I think about the river that runs at the edge of my town, its steady gush a soothing rhythm of my childhood. As I concentrate, a gentle burbling sound fills the air. Crowley's eyes widen as a crystalline stream forms between us, its cool, clear waters flowing over smooth pebbles and under the arch of a small wooden bridge. Crowley takes a step back, clearly unnerved. But I don't stop. The dreamscape continues to shift and morph at my command. Towering mountains rise up in the distance, their snow-capped peaks gleaming in the sunlight. Bright flowers burst from the ground, filling the air with a heady, floral scent. I told you, Crowley, I say, my voice echoing in the transformed dreamscape. This is my dream. He takes a step back, looking around with a mixture of surprise and wariness. His icy blue eyes meet mine, and for the first time, I see a glimmer of respect in them. You've learned fast, Danny, he concedes.